Uh, welcome uh, to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, uh, produced by uh, Politics in Motion. Now, this week, uh, I want to talk about uh, the case of uh, somebody called Owen Lattimore, who many people uh, will not probably recognize, but uh, was a very important figure uh, back in the 1950s. Now, Owen Lattimore was a, uh, uh, born in the uh, United States, but uh, uh, he was raised in China because his uh, father became a teacher in China, and so most of his life was spent in that country. Uh, he had some education in Europe, uh, but uh, eventually ended up working in a store in uh, Shanghai and in other Chinese cities uh, as a commodity trader and the like. Uh, in the process, he got very bored with his situation, so he decided, uh, as he said to me when I went to talk to him, um, he decided he would go and find out where commodities came from. And looking at me rather slyly, he said, you see, I found out about commodities not by reading Marx, but by actually tracking them on the ground, where they came from. And that took me back from uh, the seaports of uh, China, way back inland into uh, Inner Mongolia, Outer Mongolia, Central Asia, and all the rest of it. And uh, he spent about uh, two years uh, just traveling from China to uh, the other side, uh, coming out uh, in Pakistan, uh, after two years of uh, traveling and talking and thinking and observing. And, and out of this, uh, he wrote uh, a book, and he did this sort of journeying around in, in Central Asia uh, quite a lot. And uh, a whole stream of books came out, and I'll just read you some of the uh, titles to give you an idea of how prolific uh, he was. Uh, and his books were... Uh, High Tartary, that was published in, in 1930. Manchuria, Cradle of Conflict, 1932. The Mongols of Manchuria, published in 1934. Inner Asia, Frontiers of China, 1940. And Mongol Journeys, 1941. Now, all of this body of work uh, from this very remote and uh, not very well understood uh, part of the world, uh, got him to the attention uh, of a geographer called Isaiah Bowman. Now, Isaiah Bowman was in charge of the map collection at the uh, American Geographical Society, and during the uh, settlement of Versailles, uh, Isaiah Bowman went to Europe with uh, Woodrow Wilson because they were drawing the boundaries of the new countries in Europe, and uh, they needed maps to do that. So Isaiah Bowman was uh, a very influential uh, geographer, intellectually, academically, but also with the State Department. And uh, Bowman was extremely impressed with uh, the work that uh, Latimer was doing and got him some uh, funding from the Social Science Research Council and later on fellowships from uh, Harvard and other uh, universities. But at a certain point, uh, uh, Lattimore needed uh, to actually end up with uh, some income of his own, and he got that by being offered uh, to, to be the publisher and uh, editor of a journal called Pacific Affairs, uh, which was uh, something associated with the Institute of Pacific Relations, which had been set up in the 1930s. Now, the Institute of Pacific Relations brought together uh, all the countries of the area, particularly Japan, China, Russia, and uh, Kazakhstan, and so on. Uh, and uh, so Lattimore was in the midst of a very conflictual situation. Uh, 
because uh, Japan was uh, at a certain point at war with China. Uh, the Russians and the Soviets were, uh, of course, at semi in Cold War already uh, against uh, the rest of the world. So it was a very uh, technically a very demanding, uh, but but also a, a, a very difficult uh, situation that uh, uh, Latimore had uh, taken. Now after that, he uh, in World War Two he worked in the office of. Uh, uh, security Services, which was the predecessor of the CIA. And in 1942, uh, Roosevelt requested Chiang Kai-shek in China to accept uh, Latimore as his uh, special correspondent, as it were. So Latimore spent a lot of time with Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, in my interview with him, he suggested that he had much admired him intellectually, academically uh, and politically, but that he was surrounded by some pretty rough and difficult uh, people. But during that period, uh, Lattimore also got the possibility to sp speak with uh, Mao Zedong, uh, and with Chou Enlai, and many of the other uh, leaders of uh, the rebellion that was uh, gradually brewing uh, in the rural areas of China uh, during, this, uh, during this time. So this is just sketching in some of the things about uh, Owen Latimore that make him such an intriguing and interesting person. And uh, to this day, in fact, only a couple of years ago, I was talking to a historian who is knowledgeable about Central Asia, and he said that the body of work which Latimore uh, constructed during that period was an invaluable starting point for a better understanding of Inner Asia and what was uh, going on in, in that part of the world. So this was, uh, if you like, uh, Latimore's life. Uh, but in 1950, uh, he was on a long trip from, uh, again, from China to uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, again, collecting ethnographic data and all the rest of it. But when he got there into Afghanistan in Kabul, he was met by the U.S. consular official there who said, Mr. Latimore, you better rush back to uh, the United States because uh, Senator McCarthy has fingered you as one of the top three espionage agents, uh, Soviet espionage agents working uh, within the State Department on China policy. Uh, now, this was, of course, uh, quite a shock uh, to Latimore, uh, and uh, he didn't quite know how to handle it. Uh, but uh, McCarthy at that time had originally said that he had the list of 200 names in the State Department that were actually members of the Communist Party or connected to the Communist Party. Uh, when he was asked to actually say who and give direct evidence, he couldn't do it and he couldn't do it and he couldn't do it. So he came down in the end to three, uh, one of whom was uh, Owen Latimore. Now, in Latimore's case, it turned out that uh, the reason he was fingered was because somebody uh, at Johns Hopkins University uh, had uh, fingered him as a suspect character. And that person was the professor of geography there, a man called George Carter. And according to Latimore and others, uh, what happened was this that uh, Latimore uh, was uh, having a sort of a, uh, a, a picnic cookout uh, at his house in uh, Ruxton outside of uh, Baltimore, and uh, uh, Carter was a new uh, character uh, on the faculty, and he had been invited to this picnic, and he went. Uh, and during the picnic, uh, Carter's wife went upstairs to go to the bathroom and then curious about what was going on, you know, what the house looked like. She went into Latimore's bedroom and there upon the bed she saw all these documents which had, were marked as classified. And now at this point you'll say, hello, I've heard something of that sort before about classified documents. But at that time there were no rules about classified documents. There was no reason why... Uh, Latimore should not have them. In fact, in many ways, he would have been author of many of those documents, given his privileged position with uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and his very close relationship with Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, uh, Latimore really thought that at that time, in the mid middle of the war, 
it might be possible for the United States to negotiate with Mao because in many ways what Mao was re leading was not a communist uprising of a working class, uh, but a, a rather traditional peasant rebellion of the sort that, that had often occurred in China, and that it might be possible for the United States to negotiate with Mao uh, in such a way as to uh, draw him away from uh, an alliance with uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which was, uh, of course, roughly where uh, Mao was uh, positioned politically uh, during those years. So uh, what Carter did uh, was to uh, actually tell uh, uh, McCarthy that uh, Lattimore obviously had all of these classified documents. Uh, he was obviously doing some shady business there, maybe copying them or something or giving them to somebody. And so uh, the suspicion immediately fell then that this was what Lattimore uh, was, uh, was, was doing. Initially, uh, the Democrats were in power in Congress, and uh, in 1950, uh, there was a hearing uh, of the Senate uh, commi relevant committee, which basically was a whitewash and just said it was nice to Lattimore and kind of said, well, you, have, you know, didn't raise anything about these documents, but uh, was really about, uh, you know, in what degree are you a member and caught up with uh, being being associated with the Communist Party, and in particular uh, with Communist Party politics and the China question. But of course, in 1949, uh, Mao had uh, taken over, uh, and a big inquisition occurred in the United States over who had lost China which uh, Lattimore himself thought was very peculiar because, as he said to me, you know, I, I took the position that China belongs to the Chinese and what the Chinese do is whatever the Chinese want to do. Uh, so this idea that somehow or other we lost China uh, was to him a rather ridiculous uh, notion. So, but however, uh, there was then a change uh, in Congress of power and uh, the Republicans came into power and the Republicans uh, decided that they were going to actually interrogate uh, 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 Larry Moore at, at, at uh, sufficient length. And in, in, in doing so, they did a great deal of research. And one of the things they did was that illegally, because they had no uh, order to do it, illegally they, they actually got all of the records of the Institute of Pacific Relations uh, and therefore they had a very strong record of all the things that Lattimore had been doing from about 1932 or 33 right the way through to 1941. So they knew where he'd been, what he'd been doing, all of his correspondence. They had a lot of, lot of information and uh, they took the view that uh, some of the things that Lattimore had done uh, with Pacific Affairs was uh, rather favorable to the Soviets and uh, rather uh, specially uh, targeted in relationship uh, to uh, China. Um, now this was uh, therefore uh, one of those things where, again, he, what he said to me about that was, well, I, I felt it was my duty as editor of Pacific Affairs to get every perspective that I could, and I therefore needed the Soviet perspective. And if the Soviets were going to publish uh, something which was ideologically rather uh, at odds with uh, what the rest of us might think, I, th I thought I should publish it simply so that everybody could see where the Soviets' heads were at in terms of scholarship and in terms of uh, political evolution of this very, very sensitive uh, area of the world. So this was, this was the sort of uh, uh, information, however, uh, that the committee had against Lattimore, and in the end they, they brought him in and, under a subpoena and forced him to testify. And he testified for eight days, continuously. Uh, he was not allowed to consult a lawyer during this testimony. He was not allowed to consult his notes. He wasn't allowed to do anything. At the same time, all the people in there had all this information about him from uh, the, the documents from the uh, Pacific Affairs. 
uh, and at a certain point he complained about this. He said, you know, I'm supposed to remember, remember who I talked to at some point in 1934 and 1936, and very often I have not been able to remember uh, everybody that I talked to. But you then, then turn up and say that I did talk to them when I say I can't remember, and you think and this is... So anyway, this was the kind of harassment he was, uh, he was, he was getting. Uh, there was also some uh, difficulties in the hearings because he had a very important uh, uh, academic figures who testified against him. Uh, the most important one was a man called Karl Wittfogel. Now, Karl Wittfogel had been in the German Communist Party in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, but Wittfogel was uh, an environmental determinist, and he thought that uh, there was a certain determinism which connected irrigation works with centralized government, and that therefore China was always destined to have an autocratic, centralized uh, imperial regime, and that this was therefore uh, what you had to negotiate with. And Wittfogel was uh, emphasizing the fact that there was a grand debate uh, in the Soviet Union, led by Stalin, as to how to characterize China. Should it be called uh, a, uh, uh, an imperial uh, uh, system uh, which needed to be confronted, or should it be considered a feudal uh, situation in which land ownership pre preempted? And there was a big debate within the Comintern on these questions. Stalin settled it by saying that China was feudal. Uh, Wittfogel believed it was despotic. And so uh, Wittfogel was actually expelled from the Communist Party because he didn't accept the China line. Now, uh, Latimer was in the habit of referring to uh, China as feudal and thought that it was feudal and, and, and worked with it in those terms. And for that reason, what, what uh, Whitfogel said to the committee was uh, that uh, you could tell that, that Vladimir was a communist because he had taken the Communist Party line, uh, that uh, China was feudal, and, th and there was no question that uh, only people who were kind of uh, favorable to the Communist Party would take that, that position. Uh, now, this was uh, news to uh, Latimer, uh, and uh, he, he was kind of, kind of saying, well, you know, look, lots of people call it feudal, and uh, there's no reason why uh, I should be considered a communist because of that. But this was the main means of interrogation of leftists at that time, and I want to make this very, very uh, important point. J. Edgar Hoover took the view that it was very difficult to correct to uh, actually identify a communist uh, directly. But you could do it indirectly by understanding what the Communist Party line was on a bunch of issues. And when you heard somebody quoting that line or using that line or referring to that line, then they should automatically be placed under suspicion. So if the Communist Party line was, was China is feudal, if, 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 uh, uh, if uh, Latimer used it, then he was uh, obviously uh, connected somehow or other to the Communist Party apparatus. So this went on for this interrogation uh, under subpoena uh, in Congress. Uh, went on for eight days, and at the end of it, uh, Latimer was criticized heartily for his disrespect. Uh, he had, uh, had sometimes joked with, uh, at the, the, he couldn't believe, I think, the nature of the questioning he was getting, and he joked sometimes about, about things. So uh, he was, uh, uh, it was recommended from the committee that the Justice Department uh, uh, try him for perjury. So a, a grand jury was set up, and that was all the things that you've been hearing about recently, the grand juries and so on, uh, took matter. And at the end of it, the grand jury nominated that he should be uh, actually tried for perjury. And one, one of the big perjury questions was uh, this question of uh, feudalism and uh, that he was adopting the Communist Party line and that he'd lied when he said he was not a Communist Party member because he had uh, of clearly adopted the Communist Party line. So this was where he was, he was at, and he was uh, therefore uh, put under suspicion. Uh, the university put him on paid leave, um, and he was therefore going to have to fight this legal case. And uh, he'd already been 
uh, with all of these interrogations under uh, a cloud, if you like, for, for two or three years, and now he had to face uh, a trial. And it went before the judge, and the judge looked at this and said he didn't really think these uh, uh, charges merited uh, uh, trial. Uh, and uh, the only two that did were so minor as to be immaterial. Uh, the government appealed this, and it went to a, an appeals court, and the appeals court reinstated some of the charges, and it came back in down, and uh, uh, again, the, 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 the judge, uh, uh, junior below, kind of said, well, there was a real difficulty with some of these charges. And uh, the, the defense had great fun with the term feudal because it turned out that uh, President Eisenhower had used the term feudal, Winston Churchill had used the term feudal, Time magazine had used the term feudal, and so they, they came to all of these people who had used the term feudal about China and said, uh, well, if you use the word feudal as an indicator of uh, you're, that you're a traitor to the United States and that you're a member of the communist conspiracy, uh, you know, this was just not, not on. So again, uh, this was dismissed. Uh, it went back to the appeals court again, but this time the appeals court uh, was constituted in a different kind of way, and the appeals court didn't have a majority to, to vote against uh, Lattimore. So he was then, uh, they withdrew the charges, and after five and a half years of ha harassment, uh, Lattimore was uh, let go. So I was kind of very curious about this whole kind of thing because Lattimore held a position which was five years before I came to Johns Hopkins and I was beginning to read Marx and I was thinking I should understand how this kind of thing goes on. The McCarran Committee uh, the, the, the report went on for something like 6,000 pages. Um, I, did, I didn't read all of it, but I read all those bits that had to do with uh, Lattimore, and it was uh, damning of him as a person and damning of him as a, uh, as a traitor to the United States. And one of the things this explained to me was, when I, if ever I mentioned the, the term, about Lattimore to my colleagues at Johns Hopkins University, you would get two responses. One response was to regard him as a brilliant scholar who had been effectively been wrongly martyred by uh, the McCarthyite movement, and the other was that he was a downright traitor to the country and he'd got away with murder because he was really uh, very much about furthering the co communist conspiracy. Uh, the McCarran Committee uh, uh, came to the conclusion that China was lost, not because of Mao or because of the China, the Chinese masses, but China was lost uh, because a small group of uh, uh, academics and intellectuals and State Department officials had actually allowed uh, the, 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 the sort of the, all of the events to, 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 to go on without reacting pro properly to the, what it was that turned out to be a mainstream threat. So this then is, is what McCarthyism was about, and I want to emphasize the ill feeling there was, uh, the viciousness of a lot of the, of the commentary. And this was not only about uh, intellectuals and academics and policy makers and all the rest of it, because Baltimore was uh, an ethnic city and there was a very large Polish community in Baltimore. And uh, of course, Poland was uh, annexed into the Soviet orbit uh, in 1945, 1944. And uh, the Catholics in uh, the Polish community were extremely angry and extremely flawed. And so there was a huge division uh, amongst the Polish uh, ethnic community between those who still supported uh, the Polish government, even though it was communist, and those who were kind of viciously opposed to it. And you, you couldn't go into that community and talk about this at all. And when I tried at a certain point to talk to people there, they kind of said, well, no, no, they didn't want to talk about it. They refused to talk about it. And this was actually true of Lattimore as well. But when I went to see Lattimore and when he had left uh, Hopkins, he went to uh, set up a China Studies unit in Leeds University in Britain. And he then retired in 19... Uh, 69 and 1970, and I went to see him around 1972, 73, um, and uh, uh, just to talk to him and find out uh, uh, about how how things had unfolded. 
but he made very clear to me that he didn't want to talk about the McCarthyism at all. Uh, he refused to talk about it, and he wanted to talk about Inner Mongolia and what Inner Mongolia was like and why he was uh, so delighted that he was being honoured as with the, with the gold medal of the Ulaanbaatar uh, Academy of Sciences in, in Mongolia. So he was just very much full of that. But he did make clear to me that his sentiments were anti-imperialist that he thought that uh, the United States as an imperialist power had missed a clear opportunity to do something very positive in relationship to China during the years of 1940-42, and that uh, China could have gone in a different kind of way if the United States had not isolated it, and not uh, uh, you know, attacked Mao and, and, and uh, decided that Mao was, was, was communist and therefore you know, anybody who was sympathetic with what Mao was doing in those early years and even later, anybody who was sympathetic to that uh, was, was, was clearly of a China right and, not, and therefore treasonous to the United States. And the viciousness of a lot of this, I think, is something that people forget. And I think this is important in the present because we're seeing the same sort of thing going on now. And we see much of the media saying, oh, this is not who we are as Americans. We, 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 we are different to that. We, we've come off a period where uh, we at least got, got along and, we, and, and America has always got along. Well, America has not always got along. If you go back to this period and the, the sort of violence that was... Uh, 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 attributable to the to the far right and 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 some of the responses uh, uh, to it, these these sorts of things were were were, were going on, and we, it wasn't only the McCarthyism; it was, of course, the beginnings of the civil rights movement and all the rest of it, which was uh, roiling America. So this was a very very difficult time, and what you see is an academic who. In a way, it just walked into the situation, and one of the conclusions I made was that uh, Lattimore understood Inner Asia far, far better than he understood the United States. He miscalculated, really, in terms of the virulence of the opposition, the violence that could be visited upon him by the McCarran Commission, and, and the way in which uh, the society works in this rather brutal and brutalizing way. So uh, Lattimore was uh, a figure of that sort. Uh, there were many others around in Baltimore at the time. There was a very famous uh, uh, sci uh, me science medicine, uh, history of science medicine, uh, who committed suicide because of uh, the, 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 the McCarthyism. Uh, many of the academics who were McCarthyites who got hit, hit by McCarthyites uh, were uh, actually expelled from universities. They set up in places like Mexico and some went to Canada as well. So this was a very, very difficult era uh, in the United States. And the, uh, what we are seeing right now is the sort of return of that kind of politics and the return of that era. And in a funny kind of way, uh, I think there's a certain truth to a, an article that uh, Richard Hofstadter wrote which was called uh, the paranoid style of American politics. And this paranoid style is with us. It's always been there. If you go back to the 1920s and the Red Scares of that time, if you go back to the Know Nothing movement of the 19th century, uh, you'll see it again and again and again. It erects its ugly face until somehow or other something has so, so far has managed to rescue it and so it's been able to, to, to recover. But right now we are in a situation where this kind of thing is going on and it's a very terrible th situation uh, to live through. And Lattimore's uh, terrible experience of five and a half years of interrogation and harassment uh, and the kind of violence that went on around that, the first uh, House on american Activities committee meetings were held were also in Baltimore. And uh, one of the participants who was called to... to you know, to testify and said, well, I went and I testified in the morning. When I went back in the late afternoon, all the windows in my house were broken. And so again, this is, t this is testimony to the fact that uh, this sort of uh, uh, right-wing conspiratorial harassment is not new in the United States. It is, is in fact, uh, uh, sort of baked into uh, the, the American psyche in lots of ways and in lots of moments it comes out and it is coming out right now.
uh, even even more, cl more closely uh, to what uh, uh, Latimer was about than uh, you can imagine.